All right, well, welcome back into this room. After an hour of Sammy, you really want to sit in on another session about this stuff? That's amazing. That's amazing. But fortunately, Sammy and I, um, uh, what we're interested in using, I'm actually going to cover a bunch of the same tools that he talked about, uh, but the way that we use them and what we're interested in are different. And fortunately, I've never sat in one of Sammy's classes, and he's never sat in one of mine, so that we, um, uh, we haven't learned all of the tricks yet. <laughs> All right, so again, I'm Tim Mangan, Team Merchant Technologies. We largely do training around packaging. Appy and MSIX is our, our big focus. Uh, but we're often sitting in a room like this. This was uh, one of our classes, uh, Phoenix, that one would have been, um, where you know, we'll have a number of people who are desktop engineers. They're trying to figure out how to do repackaging. Um, and we, we bring them in and, and train them not only tech on those technologies, but also a lot on the stuff that I'm talking about here with debugging. Because when it comes down to it, as there are problems, you can't get the apps to work unless you, A, understand Windows and how it works, understand how to troubleshoot, and you have to learn about the apps themselves. So that's what we try to do. So I'm going to try to take you through five steps here in debugging and the way that that I like to go about it. So we'll start with just gathering the information because when there is an application problem, we're going to get some type of information from the application itself. It might just crash. It might give us dialog boxes. It may have some text-based logging that we can go look at. And so you know, we're going to start with just looking for stuff straight from the application itself. Of course, the event viewer is another place. And it's amazing, particularly with like the, the app debug debugging. It's amazing how many times we forget to go look at that log. <laughs> because we're always thinking, oh, it's app v. I should look at the app v logs that are going to be down in there. Right? But uh, the application log, and also sometimes the system log, are two places you got to remember to go look. Because the will, applications will put information there. And they're usually telling you exactly what the problem is. So you want to make sure you, that you check those out as well. We'll come back to that one, uh, the tool, a bit later. Uh, we heard from Sammy a little bit about the uh, Process Explorer, um, that's a good tool. To me, Process Explorer is about finding live information about what the app is doing right now. Um, it's not very helpful for an app that is very short-lived because you got that little timer there, and if it lives for a second, it's just going to show up and then kind of go away on you. Um, I did learn, thank you, Sammy, for the, uh, uh, the tip there about the space bar. I never knew about that one. Okay, so that might help. But when I want to see something that's more historical, I'm going to go to Process Explorer to do that one. Okay, so that's the other go-to tool. We'll go through some things on each of these as well. Um, this is the newer version of Process Explorer. Notice the fancy icons up there. Whew. Yeah, it took me two or three days to try to remember which one I wanted to hit. <sighs> There's no tooltip. You know, you know, you have to get the tooltip to get the tech stuff. They don't have one on there. I don't know why. So, but uh, but otherwise, it it works pretty much the same, except for one thing. The filtering on these lists here, you go change your filter, it is really, really slow. So not only did they change this stuff up to the top into the modern uh, uh, user interface stuff, they also did this thing here, which is a, uh, a, a grid list, basically. Um, and um, that's why the performance is so much slower, I think. Uh, but, uh, uh, it, you know, you go take a capture, and once you get beyond, like, about 2 million entries down in your capture, you go change one filter, you're waiting five or six seconds for the screen to update before you can do the next step. So it's a little bit annoying to me for the way that I use it. All right. So we're going to use tools like that to, to gather information, but we really need to also work on our knowledge not only about the application, but also about Windows and these tools. So we'll go through some things about that. We talked about the event viewer and, and the application security logs, but of course the applications and services logs is where all the new cool stuff is. So this is the portion of the event viewer information that comes from Event Trace for Windows, which is the more modern version of events to do this type of logging. Microsoft puns, puts a ton of stuff in here, and other vendors are starting to show up in this space as well. So you want to open up that and just look for the various logs you're looking at. Here I'm highlighting the Microsoft AppV client log area, one of my favorite areas in the event viewer. Oops, wrong button. 
There we go. And it's got three logs. Now, most of these logs, you'll notice in the names as you go through them, a lot of them will have these names like admin and operational. Um, the, the name can be whatever it wants, but the tendency is with an admin log, you're going to see errors. And with an operational log, you're going to see informational messages. Now, there's also a warning category, which could show up in either warning level, I should technically say, on those events. And there's absolutely no reason why we don't, like in the app v logs, I will occasionally find errors in that operational log. So I have to remember to go look there. And by the way, for AppV fans, if you ever see anything in the virtual application log there, it has a very specific meaning. Reboot that machine. Okay. The only time we've ever seen an error in there, the AppV client service is sick, you reboot the machine, the problem goes away. Okay. Oh, ooh, I missed that. Over here. We also have debug logs available. So up in here, the view, show, analytic, and debug logs. So how does uh, uh, the, uh, the event stuff work? Okay, we've got all these logs defined in the system. The things that we're seeing in the, the view here are the non-debug and analytic logs. Everything else is still there, but it is not shown by default. Turning that checkbox on makes it show up in the list, but it does not enable those logs. You need to find the individual log you're interested in and then hit that enable log, right click on it, and that will turn that log on. Now you can run your test and make the problem happen, come back and look at your results in the log. So that's the way you need to turn those on. Uh, you should try to remember to disable the log after you're done. If you don't, it's not the end of the world. Uh, almost all of these logs are set to a maximum disk size of a megabyte. Sometimes they're two, but usually it's one. And it's also set to just roll over so that uh, the oldest data will get thrown away once it reaches that maximum. So it's a pretty decent default settings on those. So in the case of AppV, I love turning on this debug log that's right here. Some of the other debug logs that you'll see are these other ones like this one called Analytic over here on the left. Uh, analytic logs aren't really for you. Um, they're really for the developer. Uh, they usually use that if they're trying to capture some performance information. Um, so you don't really have tools uh, unless you want to dig out Visual Studio. And I do know that most IT folks took some programming classes in college and chose not to be a developer for a good reason. <laughs> so you're not likely to go there. OK. So how does ETW, how does logging in general work? Right? We have an application. It has a problem. It says, ooh, I got a problem. Right? So if the application is writing out a text-based log, this is what it does. It says, oh, I got a problem. And it opens up the log file, usually positions the right pointer to the end of the file, writes out a line of text, and it does one of two things. Either it closes the file or it issues a flush command to the file and then leaves the file open because it's going to dump some more stuff out later on. In either case, the application can't continue execution until that information actually gets flushed out of disk. So when the application says, write this line out, it goes down to a piece of the kernel that's called the, the uh, dirty page writer. And the dirty page writer will eventually flush that out physically on the disk. But usually in this type of logging, you want that flush to happen immediately so that you can have your uh, log file open up in, in Notepad with the um, automatic uh, check for updates thing so that you can watch it happening live. So they want to do that flush. That slows the application down. And I've had situations where that's actually made the problem go away because it was really a timing issue. Right? So that's not very good. So how does it work with ETW? Well, with ETW, it works a little differently. The application says, ooh, I got a problem. But rather than opening a file and waiting and flushing and all that, it instead calls a very simple uh, Windows API call that pops down into the kernel and deposits that memory onto a queue. So it says, here's my problem. It gets put into a queue. Nobody touches the disk. Control goes back to the application, and it starts running. Overhead, eh, less than a page fault. OK, very, very low overhead. I meant a soft page fault, not a hard page fault, soft page fault. Very low overhead. So there is a thread inside the kernel. You know the kernel is actually kind of like one process? You know, process ID 4 called system? That's pretty much your kernel. And inside that process is a whole bunch of threads. You ever look at the thread count in that? It's a lot of them. Well, one of them in the kernel is this event trace thread. It sits on a timer, and every one second, it wakes up and processes the queue. So it looks at all the items. It'll sort them. It'll sort them based on what log they should go to if, if it's registered to a log file. And then it will write it out into that log file, but only if it's registered. 
So at boot time, all of those things that we saw in the event viewer that were not the debug and analytic logs, those are registered at boot time to receive the data and to go into an EVT file. Now, other things can also grab things from, uh, or sorry, uh, register for reception of the events. So I've got a tool called uh, PSF Monitor that hopefully we'll have time to look at today. That actually uses that technique. And there are some others out there as well. So everything doesn't have to go into the event log to see it, including those debug events, because that's what's really cool. So under Windows, if there are, I don't remember the numbers. It's been a long time since I've looked, maybe 70 uh, Windows logs in that list initially. If you turn on the debug and analytic view, you'll see over 140 logs in there. Windows is littered with code that every day and every hour is just writing events into the event trace. It gets there, the event trace wakes up and says, well, no one's registered for this, registered for this debug thing, and just frees the memory up. It's very, very low overhead, and they've encouraged their developers to put a lot of stuff in there. So there's a bunch of information that is possibly available to us if we know to look for it, if we can figure out what the heck it means. Uh, but those are available to us, and we can turn them on. OK, so that's how ETW works. Let's talk about error codes. All right, we'll always get a bunch of things with error codes like this. See a big, long error code like this. It probably means that it is uh, uh, some type of pattern in there that can be useful. Uh, this is an AppV error. In the case of AppV, pretty much everything on the left here is telling me about what module within the AppV client service um, actually generated the error. But it's really the stuff out on the far right that's important. As I look at an error code like this, and I want to look it up. I want to look at, at most, the last five digits. And I might only look at the last three digits. I'm going to go to my friend Google, type in Windows error codes. You put that string in, you'll find a web page as one of the first three answers. That'll be this page right here, which is system error codes 0 through 499. My first 500 error codes under Windows. And chances are the error you're looking for is probably going to be in that space. But you know, you can look at this number. If it's a bigger number, you can go to there. But keep in mind that this number is in hex, and this number is in decimal. So you get to do the math. OK, at any rate, the, first, the most important error codes out of Windows will be on this first page. Now, sometimes I will see a 7 or an 8, like up in these high order fields. And I may or may not find an error like that in this list. And that's cool, that, because what will happen is, like, I might see, say, 7003. So what will happen is 3 has a very specific meaning, and a developer at Microsoft was working on something very specific, but it's kind of that type of error, but it's specific to them and maybe has a slightly different meaning. So they'll use it as kind of an overlay bit to say, yeah, we're 7, but we're different. And when they do that, they may or may not put that information into the standard Windows documentation. So that's why I might not find it. And if I don't, I just look at the last three digits, and that's probably pretty close to what I'm looking for. All right, so what are those top ones that are in there? Well, I didn't put it on here, but zero means success, right? That's, that's a real biggie. Uh, but the top two, very often, it affects both file and registry. And the difference between them is good to understand. So we have file not found and path not found. Now let's talk about a file. The application asks for C colon a slash b slash c slash d, right? If the folders a, b, and c exist, but the file d or the subfolder d did not exist, that's where we get file not found. The entire path exists and only the file is missing. We also have path not found. That means one of the folders itself didn't exist, right? So that's the difference between those two. Now in the registry, the folder is basically a registry key, and the file is a registry item, right? But you'll still see the same codes and descriptions of those problems. So it's really the same thing. Five access to nine is the other one. Somebody asked something to do something. They didn't have permissions to do that. You, know, you don't have write permissions. You're not allowed to delete this file. It's locked, whatever, right? Those are the three that we generally end up running into as we look at application issues. I have no idea what that slide's supposed to say. I was supposed to say something really important there. We're just going to move on. Let's see if that helps. See in the next slide. Uh, change events when it happened. Oh, okay. Now I got it. 
Right, that's an introduction to a new section. <sighs> Need more coffee. All right, so um, as we deal with technologies like AppV and MSIX, but also those user environment management products that want to capture user settings and data and move them around and, and allow users to roam and things like that, um, we end up using some intercepts as a technique to make those things happen. And when we do that, we have a couple of choices of the way we do these things. One is to intercept for the purpose of monitoring, just to be able to tell you what was happening. So process monitor is one of those, right? It just intercepts all of these file and registry calls and tells you about what was happening. But we can also use those as ways to modify the behavior. And so in a virtualization or containerized system, we're often wanting to redirect file and registry accesses to a different location. But the techniques used are really the same. And I'll talk about what those techniques are under Windows. And there's two of them. There's DLL injection and filter drivers as a way to get the job done. We'll start with the DLL injection. So in DLL injection, you have some code. I'm not going to make anybody actually read code here. Don't worry. You have some code. And the application wants to call some Windows API. Let's, let's make it simple. Let's call it create file. Right? a Windows API that the application developer might want to write. So in their EXE, they're going to have to load a DLL from Windows to be able to do that. It's actually going to be kernel base.dll in that case. It's where create file lives. And there will be some instructions in the executable file that say, hey, load this DLL when you start up. In addition, there is a portion that's called the import table. And the import table is just a two-column table. It's got the name of a function, create file and a placeholder for where the address of that function is. So as the DLL gets loaded into memory of this standard DLL, this table gets updated to where that actually got loaded into memory. So now the application can make the call to create file by just calling through that address. So that's the basic way that these uh, applications work under Windows. When we want to use DLL injection, we inject a second DLL into this function. And we're typically doing this without the application's knowledge. So it didn't know that this was going to happen. We inject the DLL. During the DLL injection in its attachment phase, it will actually take a look at this address table. And it's going to find the, at the entry in here for the function that it wants to intercept. Create file. Finds the entry in the list makes a, lo a local copy of that address that's in there now, so it now knows where the standard function is. And then it actually just replaces the address to point to a function within that DLL. And now if we're thinking about something that's just like a monitoring thing, it can come in, and anytime the application tries to call create file, it's going to end up here. This thing will record what it wants to and then send the call on. If it wants to make changes during that call, like a file redirection, it would have the ability to do that in here as well. So that's the way DLL injection basically works. It works for situations where this is a user mode process. And that's one of the key limitations, the difference between this and the filter drivers I'll talk about later, is that we do this up in the user level. Now, if I were malware, wouldn't I want to do that? Sorry, I went too far. Not the button I was trying to hit. There we go. If I were malware, wouldn't I want to do that? When we first wrote Softricity's soft grid stuff, we did it using basically this technique. Okay? We did a DLL injection, and we basically did an injection across all of the Windows APIs that we could find as a way to make the product work. And we did it, it wasn't actually called DLL injection in those days, it was called hooking. And hooking got a really bad name and had to get banned, and Microsoft made changes to the OS to prohibit it from happening. Because this is kind of what malware might want to do. In fact, that's what malware in those days was trying to do, was to get in and actually get into the running programs and make changes to the code space um, as, as a way to make that happen. So Microsoft made some changes to put in some limitations on how this can work. And basically, there's only two cases that you can do a DLL injection into another process. Number one is that your process is running at the system local level. Okay? Number two is you're the parent of that process. 
So in the case of the AppV client, that is an AppV client service running under local system. So it has the ability to do DLL injection into any process it wants to. And of course, it's only going to be doing it into those running inside an AppV bubble. As we talk about MSIX and we use PSF Launcher as a way to do things, PSF Launcher does a DLL injection. It does it because it's the parent process. So we change our shortcut to point to PSF Launcher. PSF Launcher starts our target process and then does a DLL injection into it for all of the fix-ups that we need. If you are a Citrix customer, Citrix does an awful lot of DLL injection into every user process. Right, all of that USB redirection stuff that they do, well, that's a DLL that gets injected. They do it through a slightly different technique, which is basically this one here, which is they use an out-of-process COM service object. All out-of-process COM service objects run under the local system account as well. So they have authority to do that across the board. All right. So between these two, though, all of these things we see on the right-hand side of the screen are really using one or more of these techniques to get the job done. AppV uses them both. MSIX, in terms of the product, does a little bit of filter driver, but it's actually some magic built right into the OS. So I can't really put it in this slide. Um, let's see, I said AppV uses both. And then um, when we bring the p package support framework, um, that's doing the DLL injection as a way to get it done. Okay, so let's look at the filter drivers. Filter drivers uh, became a, a way to solve some problems we actually had originally before Microsoft put in the filter driver system. So back in XP, tools like Process Monitor would load themselves in as a kernel filter into the system, and then um, other people would want to come in and really attach into the same functions, right? Because we all wanted to look at what happens when someone uh, tries to uh, uh, open up a registry key, for example. And so process monitor, back actually in those days, it would have been uh, Regmon for this one, right? Regmon would attach in, and then some other vendor would come and attach in, and they'd both be trying to be run at the same time. And that would be okay, but then when you uninstalled one of them, if they didn't actually write their uninstaller cleanly, um, you'd end up blue screening your system because you were making changes down in the kernel and whenever you have a memory violation in the kernel, unlike the application space where the application puts up a pop-up and said, I died, you get a blue screen. So we want to be very careful about that. So Microsoft wanted to make changes. They created the uh, filter driver method as a way to do this. And filter drivers are simply the driver gets loaded in. It affects every process in the system. And they have a specific order. So as the application makes a call to do something with the, either the file or registry system, a filter driver will have an opportunity to intercept that call for whatever purpose that it needs to do it. And these are put in some type of set order called an altitude. And the application basically will come down and it'll call one, through every single filter to get down to the file system at the bottom. Now, altitudes have very specific numbers associated with them. Microsoft um, maintains a registry of them. So when a vendor wants to create a filter driver, they apply to Microsoft and get what's called this altitude. These are the different categories for the filter drivers that Microsoft has defined. And the order here, I'll give you an idea of why this might be important, is these two categories right here. FS filter compression and encryption. So the compression might be that little thing, right click, see tools, um, save some disk space and allow the system to compress files for me because I'm running out of space on my drive, right? We've all done it. Let's admit it, we've all done it at least once. Um, you know, that's done down there. Uh, it, uh, the encryption stuff, that would be like the, uh, the BitLocker type of uh, uh, disk encryption uh, could be in there, but it could also be third party, you know, it could be someone else's in here. But you think about taking a file and you compress it, it gets smaller, right? You take the file, and you encrypt it, it gets a whole lot bigger. What happens when you want to do both? Well, if I take the file and I compress it and I encrypt it, I get something that's out in this space here. If I take the file and I encrypt it and then I compress it, it gets bigger still. In fact, almost every compression engine out there will detect how bad it's going to be and not actually compress it and just slip on the compression header and say, yeah, but I didn't really compress it. So it only gets a little bit bigger. So the order becomes really important here. So as the application is writing down to the disk, we want to make sure we compress first and then encrypt second. 
Microsoft documents here where you can find out what all of these things are, but you can also look at your own systems. So the Microsoft documentation, I'll point out, was written for Windows XP, has not been updated, and this second line does not exist in the documentation, but start a command prompt using run as administrator. Don't listen to Sammy, it's okay. All right, you type FLTMC, just hit return. Don't worry about the instances part. You get a list like this. This is, uh, that looks like Windows 10 to me. Um, this is a Windows 10 list off of one of my machines, and these are the various filters we see. We see the altitudes. In fact, it actually puts them out in the order, so I can think about this from top down, uh, of the order that they go through. Um, here's a shot here using uh, Live KD. Remember, he was just talking about that, right? So I go to Live KD, do dot load FLTKD, then bang filters, and it'll show me the filters. Same information. I mean, it's, they're providing some more here and here, but I don't really care about it. Um, but we got a whole bunch here. But let's talk about a few of them that I see in here. Uh, this was actually from a Windows 7 system. So I had an App v4 system set. Oh, I hit that button again, didn't I? It's been too long since I've used this tool. Wow, I really held that down, didn't I? We've got so much to talk about, I'm never getting done. Let's try this button. There we go. So I had an App v4 client on it. That existed as a single filter driver right at the top of the list. I also had AppV5. AppV5 has three different drivers in there. The AppV VFS driver, up around there. The AppV stream driver, somewhere around there. I'm trying this without looking. And the AppV VE manager, all the way at the very bottom. So these drivers have very different purposes to them. The AppV VE manager is responsible for detecting that an application should be virtualized. So the application goes and it tries to launch. User goes to the shortcut, says, yeah, run this thing. A new process gets created. A operation called load file gets put to load the EXE into that new process. AppV VE manager says, wait, let me look at this. It looks at the file path, says, ooh, that EXE lives inside of the app v cache under C program data app v blah 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 blah. I think this needs to be virtualized. Hold everything, contacts our friend the app v client service and says, hey, I think this needs to be virtualized, make that happen. When the client service comes back, it says, okay, you're good to go, and it lets the operation complete. AppV stream is responsible for the uh, cool streaming feature of app v where not all of the files actually have to live on disk. And as the application asks for portions of files, it will take a look and it'll decide whether or not that portion of the file exists on disk. And if it does, it just lets the call go through. If not, it goes out of band, out the network port to the source location and grabs those, brings them over into memory, hands it back into the application. And unless you've turned on the AppV feature called shared server client server mode, um, it will then uh, con commit the piece down to disk. AppV VFS driver is responsible for things like the application asks for C program files something, or let's say, better case, C Windows System 32. Well, if we captured some DLLs inside of our package, it needs to find those instead at C program data, AppV GUID, GUID, VFS, Pro, uh, uh, system x86, and then the name of the file. And so that AppV VFS driver is responsible for first checking inside our package area, does the file exist? And if not, then calling down to the regular location. Some of the others we see here, here's our uh, uh, anti-malware filter. So again, this was Windows 7, so MP filter was the name back then. I think on the previous slide on Windows 10, it was called WD filter. Woohoo, we've changed. All right. Um, if you have a different vendor doing your antivirus, you will see one or more filter drivers usually in that same space because they need to be in the same category, and that's the right place for them. Uh, LUAFV is an interesting uh, uh, piece in here. This is responsible for a whole bunch of the UAC prompts that you see, right? Uh, and, and by the way, you understand what happens with the UAC prompt, right? So the system says, ooh, wait, wait, this is an operation that needs some privileges it doesn't have. Um, let's check that out. It takes a snapshot of your desktop. It creates a brand new desktop in memory, puts that as an image, which it dims, puts its extra UI on there with the prompt, either asking for credentials or just the approval, depending on whether or not you were already running as an administrator. You didn't hear that, Sammy. No one would do that. And then flips the screen. So that's why you can't click on anything behind it. It's because it's not a real screen. It's just a picture. 
right? And then when you're done, it flips it back. Okay, um, the last one down here, this uh, file info is responsible for a lot of performance improvements in Windows. So things like ReadyBoot, like whenever I create a disk image that's gonna be like a non-persistent VDI image, um, part of my process is I get everything ready just before I do the sysprep, I then reboot the system and log in and I wait at least 180 seconds and then I reboot again. I do it five times. And the reason I do it is because of this filtering right here and ready boot. So what happens is when I boot, Windows is looking at the activity out on the disk in the CPU and watching that activity, it records it 180 seconds after you log in. It records that information down. The next time it uses that. And so typically in a boot, you get a whole bunch of disk reading and CPU and then disk reading and then CPU and disk reading. And they just look at the disk reading and say, hey, next time we're gonna start reading this stuff in before it really needed it. And you, what'll happen is on my systems, first time I boot, it would be, take about 30 seconds to get through the boot process and log in. After that five time cycle, it takes 10 seconds. So that's how effective it is. So uh, Superfetch is another one. Yeah, we didn't need that piece. Uh, Superfetch, on my laptop, when I uh, log in, it will immediately start bringing in all sorts of parts of Outlook for me without my asking. Because over time, Superfetch has learned that every time I log into this system, I always start Outlook as the first thing I do. So if I start out Outlook and start drinking some coffee, or I'm sorry, uh, I log in and start drinking some coffee before I start anything, most of Outlook's already gonna be in memory. It's standby memory so it can get reused, it's no, no big deal, but it'll be ready to go and my Outlook launch fastest faster. Uh, app prefetch is another feature for loading in DLLs. It monitors the app launch for 10 seconds and any DLLs that get loaded. And you'll see all sorts of files if you look in the Windows prefetch folder. It'll be kind of the name of the app and a little bit of hash for what version it is, .pf. And that's just basically a list of the DLLs that are in there. Okay. So here we have uh, a situation here with AppV. We got our three things because there's some other things that go on here because AppV does DLL injection. So when you start up the application and it wants to be virtualized, before the AppV client tells the AppV VE manager that it's ready to go, it does a DLL injection. Now DLL injection is sort of weird. If the application is running as a 32-bit DLL, I need to be only injecting 32-bit DLLs. If it's a 64-bit EXE, I can only inject 64-bit DLLs. When you are injecting the DLL, you need to be running at the same bitness as the thing you're injecting. So a 64-bit executable can't actually inject the 32-bit DLL. So they created this thing called MapInject because the AppV client service is a 64-bit Windows service always on a 64-bit machine. So it, it created a process called MapInject, either MapInject 32 or 64, and it does the DLL injection. So and its job is simply to inject that one DLL called the AppV and sub, uh, at the end subsystem for whatever bitness into that process. And that thing is responsible for features within AppV like copy on write. If the user tries to change something that's part of our package, it can't write to the package, so that has to get redirected. Well, that's where that happens. All the com GUID spoofing happens up there. Uh, all of the named object spoofing also happens up in that DLL. And that's effective, remember, this is up in user space and it's only affecting the EXEs that are necessary. And that's kind of the difference between doing something here and doing something at a filter driver. So the filter driver stuff has to check and see, well, first of all, am I supposed to be doing this, right? The app VFS driver sees a request come down. Its first question is, well, is this something I'm virtualizing? Because if not, you want it to pass through as quickly as possible and not impact the performance of the entire system. There are some other tools that do DLL injection. Um, there are a variety of tools that I'll refer to as API Spy. That's a very much older version of the similar type of tool. Um, this is one called uh, API Monitor, but there's a whole bunch of them out there. And these are tools that will do a DLL injection into a process so that you can monitor the way that they're calling, uh, typically, the Windows APIs. Um, and this is a, a great way to do some debugging when you want to see the trace to see exactly what the application asked for before anybody else in the stack changed it. 
That's the real purpose of using a tool like this. So in this case, I've used it. I've added, asked it to, uh, uh, to look at the basic Windows API things. Um, it ran some stuff. We can see here, we can see an NT query value, right? If I was looking at a procmon trace, I would only see that one query, I wouldn't see these other things that the application was doing. So sometimes this can also be a little more enlightening as to what the purpose of what the application was trying to do when you're having a problem. Okay. Uh, this is uh, PSF Monitor. It's a tool I created for the MSIX stuff, so it's actually part of the package support framework. And uh, what PSF Monitor will do is it will monitor all of the Windows APIs that we typically have an opportunity to use the package support monitor to change things at. So it's giving us a, a view that's right at that same point. So we could uh, inject this into our package, run a test, see exactly where we want to make the changes, and then uh, fix those up. In this particular case, uh, it has a GUI component to it. Um, made the GUI kind of look procmonish in terms of the way that you work with it. Uh, one difference I'd say between this and procmon is I tried to be a little more careful. Procmon sort of intermixes in the details paint, uh, sorry, column of the display things that are inputs and things that are outputs to that call, right? The application uh, asks to open up a file. You'll see a whole bunch of things there, and some of them are actually kind of what the application asked for, and some of them are the results. I try to separate that out here a little bit. Um, I also ended up making use of something I don't really love with this is uh, expected failure. This is something Microsoft originally put it into the trace. I haven't taken it out, and I haven't decided that I really like it yet. But the idea is this is a type of call that it failed. We got a path not found. But given the nature of this call, it's not unusual to see that in a trace. And that's what expected failure means. It doesn't mean they understand that that was expected by the application. They're saying that for this type of call, it's not unusual for that to happen. So it's not necessarily a failure. I'm not sure I'm in love with that, but I've learned to live with it. All right. So process monitor. So pro uh, uh, Sammy talked about a bunch of stuff here. This is the first thing I say about process monitor to every student in our class, because we go through all of this stuff, right? Very first thing I say is, okay, number one rule with process monitor is first of all, figure out what direction Redmond is. Bow to Mark Rosinovich, thank him for making such a great and awesome tool, okay? All right. That's rule number one. All right, so filters. So Sammy talked about filters. We can set those things up. We can take them out. Procmon is both a filter mode driver as well as a GUI component, right? So the filter, uh, the driver is always capturing everything, well, apparently except for that other feature, maybe. Um, I, th I still think it probably captures everything and it's the, the GUI piece that's throwing it away. Um, but uh, uh, everything's in there. It's okay to overfilter. There's a bunch of filters that are built into the product. You can add more to them. You can take them back out when you need to do that. Now for me, I'm usually running process monitor because I've got this application and I've packaged it up and I'm trying to test it and it's not quite working. So um, I'm looking for information about that particular application. So one of the things I want to do in my filtering is I'd like to eliminate all of the background noise of Windows. And a very easy way to do that is to just start up a filter trace and as things start coming in, you right click on the column of the process and you right click and you say exclude that name. So that does an exclusion. It's a little different than Sammy did. Rather than doing it by process ID, it's actually doing it by process name. And that thing is now gone forever. Really cool. And I just keep doing that until stuff stops showing up. And then I'll clear out the, uh, the current log and now I'll run my test. And I'll probably get the stuff that's mostly my application. There might be other stuff that shows in. That's OK. Now, if all I'm doing is an application, it's a very simple application. Well, that's where I like to use th this uh, piece, the, the process tree, or the way that I always have learned it. It's just control T, brings up this dialog, find the process I want. I usually at that point though, I'm not doing included process. Um, I'm doing just go to event. That'll just jump me to the event in the list, which is a start of that process, and I can start looking from there. Usually I wanna see the other things that are in there. I did it again, didn't I? That button is too close. Okay. Um, so n there are a number of times where there's not just a single application, and that's where the control T tends to work a little bit better as well, because there are going to be two or three applications that I want to look to in the list. There are some things in Process Monitor you want to uh, learn 
to ignore. Um, one of this is fast IO disallowed. Um, I don't really have time to get into it, but basically it should have been in the default filter list. Um, you don't need to worry about it. The, the file system has a fast and a slow path. The application tried the fast path. It didn't work. It immediately makes the call and succeeds or not. In fact, it'll always succeed because it won't come back with the fast IO disallowed if the thing didn't exist or any of those other problems that might have occurred. So you can just ignore that. Um, file locked with only readers. That's just saying I'm lock putting a, placing a lock on this file, but if anyone wants to use it for read purposes, it's okay. So in this case, this happens to be an EXE. It's just protecting itself. You don't want someone writing to you or deleting the file while we're trying to run some other process. So it's just protecting itself. Unless I know I'm dealing with a file lock problem, I don't care about those. Um, buffer overflow is your friend. Buffer overflow means memory was not corrupted. The application was required to provide a memory buffer to, to do this query here. This is asking to, to read a registry string. It doesn't know how big it is. It's required to provide a buffer big enough. Length 144 says, hey, you needed another 144 bytes. It's going to make the call again and succeed. Same thing in the file system. If it's doing a, a, a query to look at information about a file, um, it has to provide that buffer. So buffer overflow is your friend. You can always ignore that one. There are patterns you want to learn to ignore as well. Here's a great pattern. The application wanted to create a folder, which is actually the entry we see here. They called the Windows API, and the Windows API first called to see does it exist. It got a name not found, and the API then went all the way to the root of C and tried to create every folder along the way. Those folders existed, and that's what name collision meant for the return. So you just want to start to recognize patterns like this and say, okay, fine, this is what it was doing. Here's another one where the application was loading in a DLL. Application doesn't know where the DLL is going to live. So the application just says, I want cryptbase.dll. And it's up to the Windows uh, uh, load library function to figure out where that is. It's going to look in the current working directory. It's going to look at uh, potentially a, a way that the application could have registered dynamically some folders. It's going to look at the app path registration for that executable. And it's going to look at your path variable. And it's just going to walk through until it finally gets it. So when I see this pattern, as soon as I see it twice, I just start looking for, oh, I got a success. OK, here it is. Fine. Understand that pattern. Also understand the detail column. So create file can mean a lot of things. It's developer shorthand for create me a file handle. It's not necessarily creating a file, but once in a while it is. This top example right here, it's working on a directory. Directories themselves are files. The content of the file is the list of things that are underneath it. So it's actually opening up and it's asking for read data list directory for the access that it was requesting. Here we have a case that's a file. This is actually one of those ETW files. And notice the process ID, process four, was actually writing to that file. And it's asking for read and write purposes. Also to be able to add the file in case it didn't exist. Also ask for delete permissions, which I don't think it should have done because it shouldn't be needing that permission there. But hey, no harm, no foul. Um, and then a disposition, what to do if the file exists or not. In this case, it said overwrite if meaning I'm going to append to the end of the file. There's another setting they could have said to say, wipe the file out and start all over. There's another one that would have said, throw back an error. Uh, here's one we see an awful lot with AppV. You see this open reparse point. Just ignore it. Uh, I don't have time to get into details. It's just something extra that happens with AppV. It has to do with filter drivers. Um, and uh, if you see those, that you can ignore that event altogether. Here's another case, though, where I have a read data list directory. You remember up here, I said that that's because it was dealing with a directory. I hit the wrong button again. That was terrible. Um, uh, but here, we're not dealing with a directory. We're dealing with a file, an exe. And the reason for that is that executables have what's called a resource section. And that's where things like icons and bitmaps and dialog boxes are stored. And it's actually stored as a file system. And it's actually trying to read the directory of what's in the resource thing because the code is trying to pull out a resource to make use of it. Um, and that's why we see that funny syntax in there. OK. Um, double clicking on events gets you this nice wide view. So you know, basically, Procmon is basically an Expel spreadsheet there. Um, once we get these really long paths, things like AppV add usually 104 characters to the beginning of every file path that we want to look at. Um, the detail column could be long. 4K monitor still isn't big enough to do that debugging. I can get down into the right area. 
double click on an event, see it in this form, the columns become rows, and I've got some nice buttons down here that I can go next event, next event, next event. Okay. Let's skip through that, through that. Um, also, that, that process uh, uh, tab there, I can check whether or not the event was running in a process of 32 or 64 bits. Sometimes I need to check that. And the event stack can be useful. I can see that this is an application running in an AppV virtual environment because these pieces are in here. And I can also see as I walk from event to event, what I'll see is this is the way you would read this is this is the application kind of at the bottom and it called this function that called this, 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 this to, to where we currently are. And what I'll notice between one event and the next event is that all of these addresses here, I did it again. Oh, well, all of the addresses up to a certain point were the same, and then um, they suddenly changed in the next event. And what that means is that the application called up to this function, it called up to the point that we got traced, and an event got registered. Call came back down, but it didn't actually get all the way down to the application. It only got down to the level of the last thing that didn't change, and it made a second call. So if the problem is that second call, I know whose bug it is. Right? So it's, it's part of isolating down where things are at. Uh, very quickly, highlighting and bookmarking are very, can be very important. I use highlighting to do things like put me a highlight on everything that says success. Some people filter out success re uh, result codes because they're looking for problems. I find that totally useless because a lot of times you'll have an error followed by success. I need to see that to understand what the application was doing. So I'll put a filter on success uh, sorry, a highlight, and then look for the white lines mostly to look for the errors. But I still have that other data there. Bookmarks are really important to help you find things. So this uh, uh, bolded line there is a bookmark. I do a control B, set a bookmark. I can find that spot later on. But I also use it as bookends. As I have a problem, I actually first start at the end of the log and try to figure out where the problem is. So with some old applications, they'll be putting up a dialog box and you get that ding sound. Well, that ding means that somebody had to read a file that's in the Windows uh, media folder, one of the .wav files. So I can just come into my Procmon trace, do a, a control F find for .wav, find the entry in there, and I know that's a spot that happened right after the problem occurred. Right? I also might see some entries in there for um, I help API.dll getting loaded. And that's usually a sign that someone's trying to do a dump of what modules were involved. So I know the problem is just above that. So I find a spot that's just after the problem, put in a bookmark. Now I'll start from the top down and try to figure out where do things start going wrong. And I'll use a bookmark there. And now I've got two bookends. I know my problem is right in that space. And I can continue to try to work that down a little bit further. All right, so since we're out of time, let me just skip through to the, uh, the, the basics on the end. Um, we've seen a number of the tools in here. Uh, Process Explorer has a jobs feature, which becomes really important under MSIX. It helps us understand what container an application is running in, or if it is a subprocess has escaped out of the container or not. Um, everything that's running inside an MSIX container will have a job ID, and the job ID in Process Explorer will show you all of the processes in that single job. There's also a job ID in the task manager, and that will tell you if it has a job, but the job IDs could be different for different processes in the same job. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. I have no idea why. Um, but uh, those are uh, important for that area. All right, so, so, so bottom line, I didn't get to anything about documentation, and that's also very crucial. I want to make sure I spend a little bit of time talk about documentation during debugging, because that's really important. When you run into these problems, if you don't get the problem solved in, in the first hour, you should expect it's going to take a really long time. You need to start your documentation immediately. How do you reproduce the problem? You know, make sure that you've actually tried to reproduce it on a clean system, that you're not looking at something else. Right? What have you done so far? As I'm doing the, uh, the debugging, I'm usually on Google looking up lots of stuff. I use OneNote for a documentation source. Anything I see up there that's important, that I think might be important, I'll swipe a little bit of text there to remind me what it is, copy it into OneNote. Not only do I get the text I swipe, it automatically puts in a link to that article. So I can go back and see the full thing if that turns out to be something important. Because when you're starting the debugging process, you don't know everything you need to know. And so you'll see some things that's like, eh, maybe, maybe not. Make a note of it. You'll be able to get back to it and get that information. 
there's a, a good possibility that uh, at some point you may be contacting a vendor about the problem. You know, it could be weeks, it could be months before they get back to you. You're not going to remember any of this stuff, so that note-taking becomes very important. Saving off log files, like your Procmon log, you know, you save that off, make sure you got it in a folder, you know where to find it later on. Um, notes of things that you have eliminated. When I'm troubleshooting, the problem could be this big, I'm often looking at it and saying, okay, can I come up with a test that will tell me, is it on this half or this half? Right? And if I can do that, I want to run that test and eliminate all of this so I can focus over here, I'm going to make sure I make a note about the test that I, that I ran. Because I still don't know everything I'm going to need to know about this problem in some cases. And at some point when I get really stuck, I've had issues where I've gone back and read my notes and realized, oh, that test wasn't accurate now that I know this other stuff. I need to fix that and figure out, have I actually covered up the problem by assuming it was eliminated by that? So uh, the documentation is extremely important as part of that process. Well, I'm out of time. I'm sorry. If you want the full version of this, you've got to come up to one of our classes.